Greetings and Ramadan Mubarak for those observing. My name is Atalia Omer. I'm a professor of religion, conflict and peace studies at the University of Notre Dame's Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies. I'm also a senior fellow with the Religion, Conflict and Peace Initiative at Harvard University. Today's event is co-sponsored by both these affiliations. And I would like to say a word about each because uh, in my view, it will help frame the uh, the conversation that we are about to have. The Religion, Conflict and Peace Initiative centralizes an analysis of structural injustice, violence and power, and examines how a more capacious understanding of religion can yield fresh insights into contemporary challenges and opportunities for justice-oriented peace building. The Religion, Conflict and Peace Initiative's primary case study has been that of Palestine, Israel. Indeed, our main speaker today, Professor Noura Erekat, is currently a non-residential fellow at the Religion, Conflict and Peace Initiative, where she is working and will continue to work in the next academic year on creating a curriculum on Black Palestinian solidarity designed for Palestinians in Palestine, as well as Arab Americans more broadly. The other co-sponsor, the Kroc Institute, has a long history of scholarly interrogation of the role of law, legal mechanisms, and international norms, conventions, agreements, resolutions, and so forth in promoting peace, which many of us recognize is not always the same as justice. Indeed, often the peace discourses can authorize, promote, and entrench unethical practices and unjust structures. Peace may be a different name for violence. The Kroc Institute therefore constitutes a scholarly and practitioner space that has encompassed not only social, sci the social sciences, but also, and increasingly so, the arts, literatures, humanities, critical race theory, feminist theory, decolonial and post-colonial theoretical interventions in order to sharpen our critique of the structures as they are and the ideologies that authorize, that authorize them. Such openings require, as feminist scholars recognized long ago, producing knowledge or epistemologies from the margin by those who are dehumanized and dominated by interlocking structures of violence, including ideological interpretive frames. This is in order to imagine alternative futures, not in accordance necessarily with the apparent constraints of the realpolitik of the presence and its logic. Such constraints help think through the question what is possible under existing frameworks, whereas critique allows us to see clearly the operation of violence in all its forms in order to imagine what ought to be the destination, the future, according to some other set of principles and frameworks of analysis and interpretations. This is so that justice will not be only for some and, and not all. There is, there is no one more person more perfect to help us think through those issues and questions in, ge in general terms and through the concreteness of the case of Palestine than Professor Nura Erika, who will walk us through her argument in a recent book, Justice for Some, Law and the Question of Palestine, which was published in 2019 with Stanford University Press. Professor Erika teaches at Rutgers University in the program in criminal justice and Africana studies. She specializes in international law, humanitarian law, human rights law, critical race theory, and multiple adjacent scholarly and activist conversations. She is a public intellectual, frequently appearing in the media, and herself an editorial committee member of the Journal for Palestine Studies and a co-founding editor of Jodalia, an electronic magazine on the Middle East. Therefore, it is clear that she is one of the contemporary shapers of Palestine studies. Beyond justice for some, Professor Erika published widely in a whole spectrum of, on a whole spectrum of issues and venues from various law reviews to American Quarterly, which is one of the flagship um, journals in American studies. Professor Erika also spent some time in Capitol Hill as a legal counsel for the Domestic Policy Subcommittee of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee in the House of Representatives from 2007 to 2009. I offer here just brief glimpses into a stunning CV, and I invite the viewers, the audience, to learn more about Professor Erika's work. 
Responding to Professor Erekat is another incredible scholar and public intellectual with an absolutely overwhelming CV for the rest of us humans. Um, this is my colleague, Professor Mary Ellen O'Connell, who is the Robert and Marion Shore Professor of Law at the University of Notre Dame Law School. And she's also a research professor of international dispute resolution at Notre Dame's Cork Institute for International Peace Studies. Professor O'Connell, O'Connell's work is in the areas of international law, focusing on, among many things, the use of force, questions, international dispute resolution, and international legal theory. She is the author or, or editor of numerous publications, too many to list here. I just want to mention the most recent 2020 um, publication in paperback of her 20, 2019 book, The Art of Law in, in, in the International Community, which was published by Cambridge University Press. Professor O'Connell is also a recipient of many honors, fellowships, and awards. Again, too numerous to recite. I will only highlight that she spent the spring of 2018 as a Fulbright Fellow at the Norwegian Nobel Institute in Oslo. So in planning this event, we thought that Professor O'Connell will be an optimal interlocutor for and respondent to Professor Erika's book in ways that will both keep us in the depth of the case of Palestine as it relates to international law and legal frames, but also illuminate how the case speaks back to some of the theoretical questions pertaining the conceptualization of law as an instrument for peace and justice with an understanding that what each term means is not self-evident and is open to critical scrutiny. So I'm thrilled to be able to moderate this conversation. The format will be will involve a presentation by Professor Erika of the main arguments she develops in her book. Upon concluding this opening presentation, Professor O'Connell will offer her response and reflection, and then I will invite Professor Erika to respond before turning to the audience's questions, which you are absolutely encouraged to submit at any point. So before we begin, here are a few webinar housekeeping details. Um, participants may type in their questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Please don't use the chat as that will be used only for any technical issues participants are experiencing. We will try to ask as many of the questions posed as possible and apologize in advance if we don't have time to get to your question. And finally, this webinar is being recorded and the video will be available on our website shortly for viewing and sharing. Let us now proceed, but before we do, I wanted to acknowledge my presence here in South Bend, Indiana on the traditional homelands of native peoples particularly the Pokagon Potawatomi, who have been using this land for education for thousands of years and continue to do so. And with that, uh, let's turn to you, Professor Erika. Thank you. Thank you for an overwhelming and humbling introduction, if I may, Atalia, Professor Omen. Um, as I've written already publicly and shared in the minutes preceding our going live, I'm especially nerding out in this moment to be with one of my first teachers, uh, Professor Mary Ellen O'Connell, who I encountered in the text as I made my earliest forays from the realm of advocacy into the academy to start answering questions that kept confronting me um, in, on, on the battlefield, so to speak, of the struggle for justice. So thank you for this honor of your attention and close read of the sex and engagement. So the story is a very personal one, right? That the book begins in my own, um, my own ambitions um, and dedication to achieving justice for Palestinians. I am a Palestinian born in the United States, not necessarily in exile, but somewhat so as my father's own identity card um, is confiscated without um, any kind of judicial review or due process and what's known, um, as, you know, uh, it, it's been known as a, as a form of um, revocation, identity revocation. So it makes it so that I have to travel back as a tourist. In that context, as a young university student in, at UC Berkeley, I was part of the first wave of, of, of student activism that launches the call for divestment from apartheid Israel on February 6, 2001, upon the second election of um, Ariel Sharon 
as prime minister, we then set off what would be later regarded as uh, wildfire of similar activity across university campuses. And mind you, this is four years before the official launch of the boycott, divestment and sanctions campaign that articulates the tripartite call for the end of colonization and occupation, for the return of refugees and for meaningful equality for the Palestinian citizens of the state of Israel. And so we are, you know, I, I can't over um, emphasize how much we were doing and how impactful that was. And yet uh, there was no change. There was no meaningful response uh, to the work that we were doing to our demands to for Berkeley to divest its endowment um, from Israel. And in that bright moment of, you know, my youthful, what was it, 2021, I decided that the proper path to actually bring, you know, emancipation <laughs> would be law. I would go to law school and then we could do it that way. Um, and not that there hadn't been Palestinian lawyers that preceded me, but I just thought we just we could do it different and right. And of course, between before a judicial panel unencumbered, right, by the political balances of power that shaped our reality and our obstacles, that we could advance the cause of Palestine in ways that all of our activism couldn't. And that was an absolutely horrific rude awakening <laughs> as I enter into what I thought would be, right, uh, uh, I'm first generation, everything. And so I had this idea in my mind that everybody in law school would be, you know, just out, you know, out there ready to, to fight the good fight. Little did I know that law school was an elite, a very elite space, a place of social reproduction, a place of being able to catapult oneself into a socio, not a, a different socioeconomic um, stratosphere in a matter of a few years, you know, especially relative to others who pursued the same course via medicine and and otherwise. And it was it was very difficult. It was very difficult. Um, and I remember, and even there, we established the Law Students for Justice in Palestine, and we held our first debate. And one of the pro-Israel student with a with a straight face makes the argument that there is no occupation and that occupation law cannot apply because there's no sovereign. So and because the text of resolution uh, Security Council Resolution 242 says um, that Israel must uh, withdraw from territories occupied in the recent conflict but didn't say which territories because it lacked the definite article the or all the and of course i'm in the audience laughing thinking what, what who is making this stuff up right um it was the first that i was encountering the argument as a law student and it wasn't until uh, a couple years later when i was studying in an independent study with a mentor who remains my favorite professor he was a professor of corporation whose family um are all Holocaust survivors, and I chose him um, to work closely with, who asked me the same question upon presenting my thesis to him when he said, but you haven't established in this work, I was examining um, the reoccupation of Janine in 2002, um, and the destruction of the Janine refugee camp during that operation. Um, and he, he said, but you, you've made an entire argument about possible war crimes, crimes against humanity, uh, you know, seeking redress in U.S. federal courts, but you haven't established that the Fourth Geneva Conventions apply to the territories. And I said, what do you mean? And he repeated the same, what I thought was the same vapid argument that I had heard at this debate. But it, it was one thing to hear, you know, a student in uh, a contentious relationship say that. It was another thing to hear my favorite professor, learned professor, say that to me, who was quite sympathetic. And so it planted a seed for me of, you know, the first critical seeds of inquiry of why wouldn't, why wouldn't occupation law apply? Why isn't it that there is occupation, therefore the laws apply, therefore we see how the laws manifest themselves. These were the first seeds of critical inquiry that are then nurtured across a career of advocacy um, that, you know, right after law school, I end up creating a job where I can basically sue Israeli officials 
military officials in US federal courts under the Alien Tort Statute. We were able to serve uh, Moshe Alon in the DC District Court and Avi Dichter in the Southern District of New York. And I felt, well, here my entire miserable law school experience was about to be vindicated until within a short year, both cases were dismissed on grounds of non-justiciability, which basically means that they that the court found that they could not be heard on their merits. So even the the, the possibility of being of being heard, of even providing platform for the survivors to share their stories, were not available. And in that moment, I decide to do what any movement lawyer would do, which is just to find another court. Maybe the Southern District and the DC District weren't optimal. Let me go West. Who doesn't want to go to the Ninth Circuit? And so, so my research took me there. And in the course of that research, I discovered something really interesting, which was it wasn't necessarily the content right, that made these claims non-justiciable, but in fact, the identity of the claimants and the defendants. And if I was able to control for those variables, I can show that there was an exception in this case, in US federal courts, an exception that didn't apply to Papua New Guinea or the Philippines or Paraguay or even China, where there were similar cases uh, that were heard against uh, officials, but that did apply when Arabs or Palestinians were suing Israelis in US federal courts. And rather than develop a strategic litigation plan to sue other uh, Israeli officials, I end up producing my first law review article. Very inadvertent. But again, the, that, that seed of critical inquiry continues to grow um, even more as I work, as you mentioned, Atalia on the Hill as I work as an advocate within the UN before, uh, before the UN Security Council, before the UN human rights treaty making bodies, um, time and again, the same kind of political obstacles were impeding what I thought should have been a very straightforward approach to legal remedy. And this drives me back to school to ask the basic question, what is the relationship between law and politics and what does that relationship tell us about the horizon for Palestinian freedom? And in the course of answering that question, that's how I produce um, this uh, book that we are discussing today. Um, and I end up answering it. I'll just give you a summary of how I answer it. On the first count of what is the relationship between law and politics, you know, the, the basic assumption that one has that I think is available to lay people actually it is the same spectrum that I think would describe the, the experts as well, right? It's the spectrum between those who believe that the law um, that the law is what it is and it can be evaluated based on its own content and that it, it, it has its own meaning based on some scientific and textual approach, right? But that same kind of layperson approach, which is also an expert approach, right? A formulaic approach, a formalist approach um, can be responded to with another, with another non-expert you know, observation, which is that, but that's not true. Because if that were true, then we would see human rights prevail without such contention. We would see, for example, the US accept that its relationship to Native Americans can be described as genocide per the Genocide Convention. It would be manifest that um, apartheid does, has applied in the United States um, before you know, the, 19, the 1964 Civil Rights Act and so on and so forth. And so those would be on the opposite side of the spectrum who, who observe, no, but law is power. And the structure of, of our international relations and our world system, whereby the Security Council is comprised of uh, 15 members, five of whom are the permanent members with veto um, authority and also the authority to use force and so on and so forth um, reveals that Law that law is basically, in the words of Richard Falk, he doesn't believe this, but as he summarized it, would say, law is a political fiction that is used to badger the heads of our weaker opponents. 
And so here you have these two um, sides. One is the absolute realist, cynical approach, the pessimist approach that just believes that might is right and that law is really, you know, window dressing versus this formulaic approach that believes that law can be observed as a scientific inquiry and has a core meaning. Um, and and in, in examining that for myself, I come up somewhere not, you know, not necessarily in the middle. I'm closer to the realists, um, but I'm not as fatalist because the, 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 the material speaks for itself. That if in fact might equals right, then we wouldn't have seen weaker parties able to use the law to leverage it for their emancipatory purposes, not least of whom are the Palestinians themselves who have been facing off with the only nuclear power in the Middle East, the US's self-proclaimed most significant ally in the Middle East, the 11th most significant military power in the world, a member of the OECD, right? So an economic, military, political power in the world. And yet we see the Palestinian Liberation Organization retool the law in order to advance their cause in many different instances. And, and especially during the 1970s at the height of third world revolt, when we see the PLO enter the United Nations to establish a corrective to Security Council Resolution 242 in the form of General Assembly Resolution 3236, which articulates a different form of self-determination without the same quid pro quo arrangement that would, um, that would enshrine Israel's um, existence, right? Or that would erase the juridical status of Palestinians. We also see Palestinians affirm that they are a juridical people that same year uh, when they established that the PLO is the sole and legitimate representative of the Palestinian people and not merely a motley crew of Arab refugees who can be absorbed anywhere else in the world. That same decade, the next year, the PLO works with the non-aligned movement to amend the decade against racism that's primarily targeting apartheid in South Africa to add into that resolution that Zionism is akin to um, apartheid and that it is a form of racism and racial discrimination in resolution 3379. And then in 1977, and here this is where um, Professor um, Mary Ellen O'Connell uh, and I might begin to overlap in my own trajectory as a student um, in that uh, that's when the Palestinians work with the non-aligned movement to basically elevate the status of guerrilla of guerrillas to legitimate combatants with the right to fight, with the right to kill, with the right to be killed, or, or that they will be killed and it won't be murder, that they will be held as prisoners of war, that they will be exchanged, that there are there could be legally regulated and are not merely uh, criminal terrorists, right? So we see one of the the one of a stateless people against this powerful state able to achieve so much in the language of law. So this idea that law can only mean um, power doesn't withstand scrutiny. So I come uh, somewhere close to them a little bit, I would say, not in the center, closer, closer to the realist to say, I agree, law is power, but power itself is diffuse. And in order for the law to be able to be used for um, in the service of progressive causes, it must be used through a sophisticated deployment um, it, for the sake of a political cause. Right, so the, the, I use an analogy of thinking of the law like the sail of a boat. If you are in a sailboat, but there's no sail drawn, you're probably just gonna float around in the water, imagining you don't have any oars either. Um, in order to move, you need to raise the sail, but the sail in itself, which is the law, doesn't determine the direction which the boat is going to flow, that is going to be determined by the wind. And the wind is the force of political movement. And that political movement doesn't have to be just the most powerful states. It also refers to people themselves and the power that they uh, conjure. So think of the law like the sail of a boat, raise the sail when the winds are blowing in your favor, draw it when they're detrimental and stitch a new sail when possible. So having answered that much, then how does it apply to the Palestinian quest for 
ongoing quest for liberation and freedom. To answer that question, I divide um, the book into five critical junctures that happen to, you know, happen to be narrated chron chronologically between 1917, basically the issuance of the Balfour Declaration designating the Palestine Mandate as a site of Jewish settlement, to 2017, where it's the tail end of the close of Israel's most recent, most offensive, large-scale attack on a besieged Gaza Strip using modern weapons technologies against a population that did not even have the right to become refugees and who are then blamed for their own death. Um, and you know, there were a few counterintuitive things that I was doing in setting up the book in this way um, because the pushback from a lot of lawyers who were reading the text was, well, this doesn't make sense. You should divide the book into a chapter on refugees in law, a chapter on the use of force in law, a chapter on occupation law, a chapter on right self-determination in law, and, and wanted it to be a more thematic breakdown, which I resisted because I felt that that wasn't telling the story I wanted to say because it would be examining each of these themes on their own. And what we miss in that is the texture of what I was saying about the law, which is that in content, it can remain the same on paper and yet change in meaning over time as a result of a shifting balance of power um, and historical contingencies. And so take, for example, one of the examples I used to, I don't, it plays out in the book, it's not its own chapter in the book, but just the story of resolution 242. When Security Council resolution 242 is drafted, in 1967 and passed by unanimous vote in November 1967, it is seen as an instrument of defeat by the PLO. And in fact, in PNC meetings consistently between 1968 up until 1988, right? Every Congress condemned the uh, resolution 242 as an instrument of defeat because it enshrined the juridical erasure of Palestinians, because it recognized that Israel was a permanent fact um, on the ground, and because it, it referred to, um, it also didn't uh, mandate Israel's withdrawal from the territories, nor did it uh, apply any political rights to Palestinians to have their own state. And so, but what we see happen over time is that in 1988, when Palestinians are now entering into what would become the Middle East peace process that for the first time entertains the PLO as a negotiator and not merely as a derivative agent or um, kind of a cousin of Jordan, um, we see the PLO amend their, in their own charter to recognize both resolution 181 that partitioned the Palestine mandate into an Arab and a Jewish state, as well as adopting resolution 242, which they basically say establishes the right to statehood and to independence. And now from, from, from about 1993, when Oslo is signed to the present, we see now 242 being maligned by uh, is Israel, Israel's advocates, Israel's political branches, its legal representatives, and its um, allies who believe that 242 should merely have some sort of descriptive function that basically is tantamount to peace, but no prescriptive function that mandates that Israel should withdraw to the 1967 boundaries. I mean, that's just one example. Um, I'll, I'll Two other things uh, as I conclude, one is to say that the junctures that I chose are 1917, 1977, 1973, uh, 1987, and uh, 2000 to 2014. Each of those junctures basically um, was a moment of political crisis that provided an opportunity for the meaning of law to be renegotiated. So these are moments of what I call legal opportunities based on what Robert, Professor Robert Knox would have uh, called, um, I think he calls it, political opportunism, right? But it's moments of political crisis where we can renegotiate the balance of power and thereby renegotiate what the law will mean, how it will be implemented and, and how it will shape how we understand um, uh, a conflict. And so I end the book um, 
I end the book with a conclusion of, of, of a very cynical reality that we that exists today and that continues to manifest itself as we see a one state reality prevail and yet no discussion of, of how that this one state reality, which in, in my analytical description, I basically describe as a settler colonial reality, whereby Israel's colonial territorial takings are consolidated within an apartheid regime that protects those takings, right? Um, and so that would mean that as an outcome, we wouldn't be responsive to this with negotiations and, and forcing the two parties who lack parity in order to negotiate, but instead we would be placing pressure on one of the parties to end a regime that has been criminalized as a crime against humanity since 1973 and has been well documented as such. Yet that is not the reality that prevails today. Notwithstanding that cynical status quo, I still urge for a optimal future drawing upon indigenous literature, um, a lot of um, African-American literature that shows us that there are no optimal um, histories to return to, but only optimal futures to forge. So using that framework, I start to think, how can we trouble the way that we've understood this as a conflict between two peoples within a traditional IR sense to start thinking about this in more revolutionary ways and think backwards. Um, and so one of the things that I do in, in, in for the sake of that exercise is to imagine the right of return of Palestinian refugees, not as the culmination of the struggle for Palestinian freedom, but literally as the beginning of the struggle to imagine what that future is, what it looks like, because Palestinians will not return to November 1947. They will only return to May 2021, to you know December 2021, or in 2022, or in 2030. What does that future look like? And what would, how could that future provide an optimal pathway to liberation uh, for Jewish Israelis as well? Um, one that is optimal to what Israel has has offered, not only to them, but I think to the world, I think is offering a very dismal future in line with that spirit. I also try to think about, you know, my, op my object here is to get out of the nationalist framework, which I feel is very constricting. And so I also use racial analysis to think about how a racial analysis, an anti-racist struggle can help disrupt the native settler binaries that have set this up as settler versus native as opposed to troubling um, the distribution of power that is actually creating hierarchies, a political economy of hierarchy of humanity amongst peoples, irrespective of whether or not they are natives or settlers. Um, that's, these are the high level, the top line <laughs> messaging. I'm happy to get into the more um, detail on, on each of those things, but I'll stop here. Um, thank you. No, thank you, Nora. Um, I personally am so grateful for the remarks that you just made, for the energy, the uh, way that you ended. But most of all, I want to emphasize right now for this book, I'm truly um, just incredibly full of admiration and um, gratitude. I, I'm getting choked up. I, I can't tell you how emotional I was reading the book. Um, there were just so many things in it that have been my longtime dream to see coming um, within our common field of international law, but uh, in, this, in this question of, of, of Israel-Palestine. So um, I'll try to be calm and put these points forward because I really want to go as quickly as we can to where you ended. I'm all about forging optimal futures. And I think we have so much here um, to take with us. Um, I want to suggest some ways we maybe depart from uh, some of the themes you developed in the book to realize that. But let me begin by saying what we absolutely have to take with us from the book. Um, to, I'm so glad you resisted the advice to divide the book up into more topics. I think that's been one of the um, uh, things that's been holding us back in international law to realizing what 
the you know the the horizons of transcendence that Marty Koskinyemi tells us we should be about that people look to international law for. I think we've been following a kind of salami tactics, which is now a favorite word for Chinese foreign policy. We've gone into our separate silos, and people working on human rights don't know anything about or very little and often problematically insufficient for talking about the law and resort to force or the conduct of force. People who specializing in refugees don't have a wider vision of human rights, of self-determination of all these things. And we've been holding each other back. We've been agreeing with wrong analyses because we haven't had the integrated deep knowledge that you display in this book. That works so well. It is so important for people to read the argument around the Six Day War, for example, not just in the Israeli claims that they were, they had already been attacked or were about to be attacked, but in that incredibly rich context that you bring it. So I, I, wanna, I want to really point out to people in the audience um, who will be listening to this recording or here now, I, I think the highlights of the legal analysis are in Nora's uh, law politics discussion and how these two different disciplines, both fictions in their own way, created by human beings, have come to work together or not work together. She's, that's so strong in the book. Your discussion of the self-determination rights of the Palestinian people at the time of the mandate, excellent. And I have not seen that level of detailed research. Um, and it's going, it, it's going to set the new standard for that important moment as important as the moment I just mentioned, the Six Day War, and so much in international impact, impacted by just wrong statements of fact about what happened. Um, and I'm very much hoping that your work will add to John Quigley's, to mine, and, and, and others to finally get just the basic facts right um, of what happened. And then um, the area I work on, well, following the Six Day War, of course, and, and this, I think your work, again, is unique in explaining um, why, in fact, there is a occupation under international law, it continues to this day, that is essential to no longer quibble about it. It's, it's just so solid in, in your work. And then finally, uh, where I'm working most these days, targeted killing, your assessment what you add to Christine Gray's work on that, um, the origins of this, this unlawful practice um, and the way you integrate that and it's just so good. So the law outstanding. The other thing which you haven't mentioned as much right now, but it's gonna be so important for our um, students in CROC, colleagues in CROC and for my own future students in international dispute resolution, your subtle revelations about how the negotiations at various points worked uh, between Palestinians and Israelis is uh, a tour de force. That work, we need so much more of that kind of analysis of how negotiations work or don't work, why they fail. Um, your information and the way you bring together Oslo 1 and Oslo 2, I had never seen that before. And uh, it, it, was, it, I, it will be assigned to my students of, of negotiation. The book, helped me to finally understand something Italia has been telling me for years, the very deeply problematic nature of the one state solution or the two state solutions. Sorry, I think Italia would tell me it's always been a one state solution, Mary Ellen, but the idea of a two state solution. And I have never been uh, somebody, I, you know, I was colleague of John Quigley's for six years. I'm so glad that you gave him, um, I mean, talk about courage. It took courage for you to write this book, but you can imagine John Quigley um, and the courage that he has shown consistently in his very honorable career. But, but John would never understand why I said Palestine is not yet a state. And I said, you cannot both say you're a place of occupation, which means under the belligerent control of another state, and be independent. It doesn't work that way. And it's, it, it, there's a cross purposes for Palestinians to both claim they are under occupation, but also independent. Because why does, where's the pressure for Israel to leave that should come from the temporary nature under law of occupation? But there, your book reveals so many other reasons besides that contradiction, why we, the, the, the vision 
of an optimal future lies elsewhere. And that was what I felt exhilaration about. Your idea of a human rights first, a human rights based approach that would fill the territory from the Jordan to the Mediterranean, that is an optimal future. I want to see how you build on that. You left me at this perfect moment. I am persuaded now. This brought together so many of the aggregate um, advocacies that I have been pursuing and differentiated and divided up approaches about human rights versus ending the occupation versus you know, what should be the, the outcome of negotiations. And then when you gave me this vision, which Italia had been leading me towards, so I give her credit, she opened me to what you were saying. And now, Nora, I want details. Okay, I want details, but I also want to suggest some um, uh, some revisions, some uh, amendments to to go and to to pursue somewhat different um, ideas that I think will move us. And of course, I'm a Catholic, so life is always a pilgrimage. It's always a journey. I, I you know, there's only one place where all these things come together, um, and that's heaven. And you know, so it's it's about leading the good life and pursuing the good struggle. So here here are my here are my ideas to suggest where you might continue building in this great work. You make such a strong case that law without a political movement is 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 a one legged stool. Um, it, it's there. It's doing something. You're tripping over it, but it's not doing the work right. Um, you point out, and you're very honest, uh, that, that so many times when international law is so clearly, the International Court of Justice decision in the Wall case, so important, so many brave people uh, articulating in the most extraordinary ways. I'll never forget my students and I watching the oral arguments with Vaughn Lowe and uh, arguing for Israel and, or for um, uh, the, the Palestinian case and James Crawford, so articulate. Um, it, that was extraordinary, and yet the PLO couldn't follow up. You speak so well about the internal political uh, issues within the Palestinian movement that have held Palestinians back. So that how can a movement that envisions this human rights first, a humanity first, from Jordan to Mediterranean, it will need a political movement. And you say, you, you diagnose the problem and the lack of it, but you don't put, I, I know it's not what we lawyers do. I think you have to, you have so understood, but let me suggest some revision right here. You, you talk about Carl Schmidt, that he makes the ultimate power, law as power point when he says, the, the sovereign is he, that which calls the exception. And then you make this extraordinary case how the Palestinians have been treated as the sui generis. The Israelis have called the exception. They have the power. They're using the law for their own purposes. But that is all process. That is all procedure. And law is more than that. What law has that ultimately distinguishes it from that process or politics is normative substance. You, in your remarks just now, you spoke to that. There are certain normative principles that are above politics that never go away, no matter how inferior the political institution and movement is, that we as lawyers have to constantly remind people they do not come from the sources of politics as so much law does. But the overriding norms, which speak to what needs to flourish in the space we're talking about, in the geographic space, in particular, the prohibition, the peremptory norm on apartheid, that is a peremptory norm. I don't care how weak your political movement is. That doesn't go away. It endures. There is a peremptory norm on genocide. There is a peremptory norm against slavery. There are very few, as there should be, but they are not out of the political source. They are from normative sources. And that's what we international lawyers need to also add to our analysis and to this vision. 
because that is our lodestar. That is where we get our orientation and where we have refreshment that no matter how much our political mistakes are made and we go down, we have those. But let me add, um, and I'll, I'll get to this in, in a moment, there's another prohibition, which is on the use of force. And that may be my biggest challenge to you, which of course I think I've got three minutes left. So I also want to say that I think there's some contradiction in your idea of this new normative space of this humanity first space. When you taught, when you, you say, you, you quote twice in your book, Franz Fanon, and that helps us see beyond the sovereign state old fashioned, you know, it's gotta be this, you know, with these borders under the Montevideo convention and blah, blah. Um, so that helps. But if you remember Franz Fanon's ideas put into practice were failures. And I am not sure that what you're really talking about is to reinvent a new political model. If you, if you study the experiments that were made throughout the post-independence and post-colonial space, spaces where, where different views because of the uh, trying to do exactly what you suggest that Anthony Angie has so often spoken to move beyond the colonial the European model to free ourselves of that, it has not worked. Um, so I'm not sure that you want to be moving in that space as opposed to a political movement that works with law to the success of people. Um, and we can talk more about that later, but I, I, I want to just challenge you a, a, as a contradiction between political movement plus law versus a new political model to replace the state. But then the thing that I know best that I have studied with most carefully and that I, I, I feel um, could, could really use revision for this optimal future is your conclusion throughout the book right up to the end where you say, we cannot reject the right to violence. And you admire how the Israelis used force to create their state where there hadn't been one, not the way they use it, which is terrifying. And, and, and you know, I had nightmares reading again about 48, 47, but, um, you say, right, this is the second to the last page of the book, in any scenario moving forward, more conflict and bloody confrontations are all but certain. We do not have to accept that. I, I, I think there have been some conclusions you've drawn on the best scholarship, but I would just urge you, for example, if you shift your analogies away from Namibia to South Africa, the model that appears is very different. Because remember in Namibia, it was a matter of pushing white people out. South Africa, it was accepted finally by Nelson Mandela and the black majority that the white people were not going. And that core part is what is more analogous to Israel, Palestine than to Namibia. Um, the, the, the times when military force works, such as in the liberation of Kuwait, is when you're pushing one army out. But when you've got to try to create something that works commonly in a space where you're not going to have the chance, that, which is what's been going on, this push back and forth. Israelis trying to push Palestinians out with military force. Palestinians taking up arms and killing is, Israelis trying to terrorize them out of the space. That will not work. And it's also, Nora, not lawful. The fundamental and most important human right to begin with in this space is the human right to life. That is where dignity resides. And to, to say that this is a place where you can defend yourself by pushing people and annihilating people is what has led constantly to this. You, you have a quote from Nelson Mandela explaining why they took up violence in the ANC to try to win liberty, freedom, dignity. But you don't talk about why Mandela gave it up. And while it is very painful and probably the most controversial thing I've ever said at the Kroc Institute, that I do not believe Palestinians have the right to kill Israelis 
to win their dignity. I have to say again, the, I know that that's a radical thing to say, but I think if we're going to start to bring into this conversation the normative absolutes, it has to begin there. That's when we say targeted killing is not self-defense. Assassination is not the way forward. Respecting the human rights of all Israelis to live is the generosity that is going to be needed. At, at some point, I'm confident is going to lead to the reverse, that Israelis will accept the dignity and right of Palestinians to live in that space. Now I'm over time, but I think I've given, I think I've made enough radical comments for now. Um, thank you. Nora, just respond to- uh, Yeah, I was gonna one. say, there, this is, why did we even do, why did I even share anything from the book? We should have just started with these comments because this is enough for the next three hours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you so much for that generous and that close read. And I so very much, I mean, I had goosebumps when you were starting to speak and, and just, this is, this is tremendous. And I, I most appreciate the way that you're challenging me um, because these are, it's, it's in that challenge and in that you know, grappling with one another that I think that we can come to produce different ways of approaching and also analyzing where we may remain divergent on a number of these things. So first, let me just address a few of the things that you said before I go to the three things where you asked me to revise and just say, you know, one of the questions that I had in mind, I heard, a, uh, you know, I'm just going to put all this out there, but I heard a recent interview with you that was great with Craig Martin, where um, you troubled the idea of thinking about Israel's use of force in the 1967 war as the paradigmatic example of, you know, a pre preemptive self-defense, which we can distinguish from pre preventive self-defense and therefore legitimate. That in the legal literature has been considered a canonical use of preemptive use of defensive force, which, I don't even resolve in the book, right? I say it's it's left to question how to settle the legal debate, but on the you know historical account, it wasn't the last resort to force, and so it was really refreshing to also hear you going head toe to toe uh, with the with the dominant legal literature on that front, which I think has been detrimental, and was detrimental in the, in those negotiations regarding what you said in terms of the negotiations. So just let me put here one of the things about writing this book was also writing a book about uh, the question of Palestine and law in a literature that is dominated with Israeli perspectives or pro-Israeli perspectives, right? So as a, and anybody who comes from a marginalized community is not gonna find themselves in the text, right? So imagine being a Native American student studying property law, but really not naming that Johnson versus McIntosh is mm -hmm. about saying that you don't exist, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of the equivalent what I did in those chapters, um, and specifically in chapter three and four on the 1970s, and then the negotiations, was not just as a legal analyst, but also as a primary researcher. There are no documents. I went back to the living interlocutors and interviewed them, which we have the benefit of doing in order to create what I'm so grateful to uh, historian Shira Robinson for describing as a new Palestinian archive, which I hadn't described in that way, but which now looking back, I see, yeah, it didn't exist. And, and now maybe it does. But that's one of the reasons one of the reasons that the story of Oslo keeps getting told in the way that it's told is because we didn't have right this other account. One of the reasons that we don't have a proper account of the 1970s as a moment of using the law for Palestinians is because we don't have a proper account of what is otherwise a super rich archive amongst those you know advocates themselves so I appreciate you highlighting that and I guess a word to the researchers out there and the students that if it doesn't exist you can make it <laughs> on term in terms of the cross purposes and of the many overlapping legal regimes. So you mentioned John Quigley here, the state versus occupation. I couldn't have done this without John Quigley's pathbreaking work. I couldn't have done this without the pathbreaking work of so many legal scholars, um, George Bisharat, Lisa Hajjar, Victor Katan, Virginia Tilly, uh, Richard Falk, right? And, and the book abounds, RDMC was the first article. He was my primary, he provided me with the language of why the fourth Geneva Convention applies when I was a law student in Professor Buxbaum's office. Um, so this work is built on 
on, on you know, their shoulders. I want to lift them up. But I want to give a contemporary um, analogy. So what you and John discussed of, of statehood versus occupation, I've recently encountered as pushback from my own community when in last July I was discussing annexation and the impending annexation of the Jordan Valley, 30% of the West Bank, east of the Jordan, or just west of the Jordan River with Trump's, you know, acquiescence. I was, I discussed that in, um, in a video, um, in an educational video, um, within a framework of occupation law in order to demonstrate the illegality of the acquisition of territory by force and so on and so forth, and the U.S. being Israel's primary um, patron since 1967 under the Lyndon B. Johnson administration. And the reason that I did that is not because I don't believe in this one state reality, and not because I don't see annexation as an ongoing um, process, in the words of Patrick Wolf, right, that settler colonialism is a process, is a structure, not an event, one that actually um, goes across the green line and that we could see in Yaffa, that we can see in Lid, that we can see in Haifa, that we see in the Negev or the Naqab Desert, right? That I, you know, I obviously have that analysis written elsewhere, but for the sake of the audience, I couldn't speak out of both sides of my mouth. And in order to demonstrate its illegality, I had to stay within the strictures of occupation law, which presupposes that the fictional demarcation between Israel and the territories actually exists, which it doesn't. Right, um, and that got me, there was a lot of pushback from my own community that I used the wrong framework. But what then the alternative to that would have been is I probably shouldn't have used the law at all to describe this, right? So what, and the same thing happens when we think about the use of force in Gaza, right? One way to think about it is within the framework of proportionality and distinction. And other ways to think about it is within a framework of eliminatory violence in the settler colonial sense. There isn't necessarily an overlap. And one of the things I found in my research is that I think even in the heyday of anti-colonialism, that settler colonialism remained, um, remained a, um, a, a bit of a blind spot for our, you know, for, for, for these, these revolutionaries, that they didn't necessarily, or they did consider it, but saw it as a threat to their own national consolidation and territorial consolidation as, as emerging in nascent states that it was a purposeful you know, negation. It's one that has also you know, brought, uh, has been a subject in a lot of indigenous discussions of lamenting that Yasser Arafat distinguished Palestinians from the Red Indians because they ceased to exist and we didn't, right? So there's, there's layers here, but the point being is that we are in this moment where we're dealing with the fiction of a partition between Israel and the territories, but that fiction is what holds up the stool that you discuss. I can borrow your analogy. It's not the same in, in using occupation law. And yet it's, it's primarily that fiction that's also impeding optimal futures that would enable us to see. So this, we have to deal with this. We have to deal with this. I have come to the place where I'm thinking strategically. So I think we can use both because not all audiences are necessarily there. So that's kind of where I'm at. But if somebody out there has better ideas, I'm all ears. What about um, your question? So let me, this is, the, you asked three things and I want to, on the first one, how can we, if I have a humanity driven future, right? Um, I, we can't abandon law as a place that holds normative substance and promise. So here I think we might diverge a little bit because even on that, right, even though, I, you know, even on that, what, I, what I've seen and what has been borne out is that in fact, it's legal work in the framework of uh, Professor Duncan Kennedy that can, that legal work can even change what might be on its face a core meaning. Now this gets us into whether or not the law is completely indeterminate and you and I can go back and forth, but just sticking to the examples, right? Israel doesn't build the settlements in the West Bank despite and in contravention of occupation law, but specifically by using occupation law and using a very meticulous argument about, you know, this idea that they're going to apply the Hague Conventions of regulations of 1907, but not the Fourth Geneva Conventions because the Hague are customary, the Fourth Geneva are not because it hasn't been incorporated. 
They're going to cherry pick the humanitarian provisions. They're going to define the Israeli settlers as protected persons within the language of occupation law. It legitimates Israel's presence in the territory. They establish the fi a temporal fiction that distinguishes permanent from indeterminate right, and the, and the fiction of military necessity. And I say all this without, you know, a lot of detail and rehashing the argument completely to say that I'm not convinced about the normative thrust that, that would be immune from the reach of legal work for cynical purposes as well. Um, and so I'll just, I, I, I don't want to conclude, I'll just leave that there um, so that I'd love to hear it because the other things you said were so much more interesting and we need to get to them. The preemptory norms. Um, the preemptory norms on apartheid and that those would be beyond, right, that those don't have to be politicized. Let me give you another example of how it did become politicized. The, we have seen Palestinians make the argument, the legal argument and another argument about the reality that there is spatial and juridical separation between two groups of people. Um, and yet, where does the politics come in? I have, I argue that the politics comes in from the Palestinian leadership itself, the official leadership that has foregone that argument because they want the state. They don't want the one state reality either. And in their quest for the state, even if it means maintaining this, what I say, being you know, stuck in a sovereignty trap and the false partition, they have clung on to the idea that there is no apartheid and instead use the threat of apartheid um, against Israel that listen, if you don't give us a state, you have to take us, right? So using Israel's own racist argument about the absorption of Palestinians uh, and, and the return of refugees as being you know, equivalent to the destruction of Israel, the Palestinian official leadership has played on that to use the apartheid framework as a threat rather than, and, and because they don't want it either. It would signal the, the end of the raison d'etre for existing. Um, and a lot of the privileges they've accumulated um, economic and otherwise. And so here we see that play out, for example, in opportunities that they've foregone. They have foregone opportunities. The BDS movement has been alive and well since 2005. They have had, you know, the difference, and you bring South Africa, and we're about to get into that. <laughs> but the difference is, is that the ANC endorsed boycott, excuse me, the, they never called it boycott, endorsed divestment from South Africa in a way that the Palestinian leadership has not and will not. Right. Um, well, they will under duress, but it's gonna. It's not now. Right. And 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 even the upheaval from Palestinians, they have not. So they've missed the opportunity to align themselves. They've withdrawn legal challenges, as you pointed out, after the ICJ, even their ICC bid. Right now, I have a lot of critique of their strategic approach to the ICC bid. They they didn't pursue the FIFA expulsion of Israel. They you know didn't push for the U.S. to veto their their inclusion as a member at the United Nations, which would have fomented a necessary rupture. They didn't ask the Goldstone report in the aftermath of the 2009 offensive set up an opportunity to sanction weapon sales to Israel. They never um, acted on that, set up a third party responsibility to not, you know, to not aid and abet settlement expansion. They never worked on that opportunity. And then most recently in 2016, um, uh, it wasn't 2016, it was I think 2017, they didn't endorse the ESCO report that found that there was apartheid but chose instead the 2334 resolution that established the illegality of settlements. So these are the political decisions that, that can actually override the political reality, the facts on the ground. And this is what I say that the law is doing work even if it's not punishing state transgression or commanding state behavior, the law is ordering the work of other um, diplomatic missions, for example, who when in my as my term as an advocate repeatedly said to me, listen, we might agree and do what you're asking us to do from your community, but your leadership has asked for something else. All right, so then on to um, your critique on the use of force and Fanon and the Fanon's vision. I'm not sure, I don't wanna get too much into this because I'm not sure exactly what you mean and I'd love to hear more from you. Here's what I meant by the uh, Fanon's you know, idea of thinking beyond the state. I think that the nation state is not an, an inevitability, 
It was not an inevitability. And it's even, you know, all of the critique that was leveled against the League of Nations as creating a racial hierarchy amongst peoples that, you know, depending on your, you know, Anki lays this out beautifully on the proximity to Europe, mirroring European society and government, we end up, you know, as post-colonial nations actually doing precisely that. And so I think, you know, Fanon does, um, I, in, in his chapter, you know, so much of, so much of, of emphasis on Fanon has to do with its, its second chapter on violence. But, I, you know, I find his chapter on nationalism and the critique of nationalism as a chauvinistic framework, the one that, you know, informs me most that I see that even in the Palestinian movement as one of the scariest things. And one of the reasons that for me, um, thinking transnational solidarity, I wanna get out of that nationalist framework. Um, and so that's where I was drawing uh, from him to think, what opportunities have we not explored? What alternative forms of governance have we not explored? What ways that we, we aren't subject to the politics of recognition as laid out by Glenn Coulthard um, based on you know, Fanon's work, should we have thought about, right? Because we see this amongst indigenous peoples beyond Palestine as well. They're in a similar sovereignty trap. And then finally, to the use of force. So one of the things that you said, I, I, I wanna agree with you first and say that, and, and Mahmoud Mamdani has made this argument as well, that the Palestinians um, have not had their, ne their ne uh, Mandela moment, right? The Mandela moment where, they, where Mandela becomes not the president of black South Africans, but the president and the leader of all South Africans, right? That, and I agree with you. And that's one of the things that I'm urging when I say, What's a future for Jewish Israelis as well, right? Okay, so on that, I definitely agree that we, we certainly have, we have not, and that's part of this, this in, what, is, what is preventing this kind of imagination? Well, it's also the conditions that we're under that makes it very difficult. Putting that aside though, when you were critiquing the use of force, you said the use of force against Israelis and you said it without qualification. And here I wanna qualify that we should distinguish between Israeli in my in my work and which I stand by the use of force against Israeli military installations and and those who have signed up for combat right um, versus Israelis writ large not for the sake of pushing them out as you say that it's either Israelis are pushing out the Palestinians or Palestinians are pushing out the Israelis um, no not for that sake and not without um, uh, qualification. And I think those uses of force are different. So for so many Palestinians, because in, I, was, I gave this book talk across Palestine and I had to give it four times because there was not one place where all Palestinians that wanted to hear the book talk could convene because of these demarcations. And, and this is, I'm just setting this up, you know, to, this is, this is a reality of, of there is only one sovereign that has the right, that has the ability and the capacity to shape everyone's life, right? Uh, the Palestinian president needs a permit to travel, right? Um, and so, but one of the things that I found there in sharing my vision is a lot of, uh, a lot of pushback from Palestinians who said, you know, that's really cool. We like that vision. It's very inspiring. But how are you supposed to do that when you have a boot on your neck? Can't we do that when we get the boot off at least? We don't have to, right? So the, the, the pushback was we are in a situation where Palestinians are not being protected, where they are being pushed off, where there is no international force that's protecting them, where there are no means. And so the use of force, I think, remains a place I'm obviously not advocating for it. I didn't advocate for it in the book and because I don't think it's gonna be strategically viable, not because I think it's immoral, right? Um, but the idea is that, you know, the use of force remains available to Palestinians in order to recalibrate a balance of power um, in order to create the opportunities um, to, to, to forge new futures or, or use new strategies. And even as you pointed out, Nelson Mandela gives that speech at Rivonia um, where he's now being tried for sabotage um, because his use of force was considered illegitimate, even though he says explicitly, we are not guerrillas. We only target the infrastructure of the state. They never even targeted um, civilians. 
uh, within the military branch. Anyway, all that to say is I think it's more complicated. We can agree, maybe on maybe we agree, maybe we don't on that this is not the optimal strategic course, but we probably are going to continue to disagree on the morality of it. Although I would agree with you that it has to be used responsibly with a chain of command in a way that I don't think Palestinians have the capacity to do right now or have had the capacity to do, um, and which still leaves irrespective a dire need to protect Palestinians somehow, a dire need to protect Palestinians, as well as our own Mandela moment, um, so to speak, uh, where we can create a vision that is for all. Um, thank you. Of course, um, the the image of the uh, the boot on the neck is something that uh, resonates uh, very profoundly for especially uh, people in the U.S. But of course, it's a global. It 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 uh, that that. Oh, I didn't even, that, I that I'm so sorry. That oh, was no, 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 no. But but the but knee on the neck. I wasn't thinking about George Floyd. May he rest in peace and power. But, uh, no, no, uh, but I I'm just bringing it um, to the foreground just to highlight something that I uh, said in my in introducing you and you alluded to um, of the kind of work that you've been doing uh, with respect to um, um, uh, the relationship building of co-resistance and the analysis uh, um, of power and violence globally and, and questions of solidarity with African-Americans and indigenous communities. Um, so this aspect of, of your work definitely connect to um, your analysis of forging kind of a different futures with that analysis. Um, so, um, I'm aware that we are starting to um, um, to run out of time, but I what, what I wanted to uh, to do um, um, I actually kind of uh, um, um, worked through the questions, and there are very interesting questions. Also, some questions that were pre pre submitted, <laughs> but <laughs> something new uh, for me. So I try to group them, and of course, I'll not do justice to to the each question, but I try to just uh, uh, for the sake of um, kind of like summary so that we'll get to hear from you. So um, so one kind of um, cluster of questions is from students. So I'm going to prioritize this. Uh, so um, uh, college student, undergraduate students, uh, um, and um, specifically law school students um, ask those questions. Uh, so one is what, how can we um, 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 navigate the, um, the ways in which anti-Semitism is weaponized um, and the kind of uh, silencing uh, mechanisms that, that, that it deploys, something that is very much even at Notre Dame is um, um, on, um, on the foreground. Uh, and law school students asking specifically of how law school students can support Palestine um, struggle, the, the, the Palestinian struggle. Um, so, uh, so this is one set of questions. Uh, another set of questions is about um, uh, the um, uh, the question of U.S. support of um, of, of Israel and through successive administrations. And um, I mean, you, we, we mentioned explicitly uh, a few administrations, but um, um, but having that point about U.S. support of particular Israeli policies and agenda and ideologies, um, the lack of support to, um, to Palestinians or framing support for Palestinians through a humanitarian lens. Um, so um, and this is another set of questions. And a third set of questions is with respect to what is exactly your position um, on UN resolutions? Are they good or bad? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so anyway, take... Um, uh, or, or, um, I can answer the last one. They're good and bad. Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say, um, can we ask Mary Ellen to comment? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I was Mary, going to. Um, Mary Ellen, I'd love sorry. to hear your feedback yeah. on that or whatever else we've discussed. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Mary Ellen, if you uh, can just kind of, I don't know, um, you know, um, uh, try to keep it as short and brilliant as usual. <laughs> yeah. Um, look. Nora has really laid out for us what we all should be doing, whether a law student or whatever, we all, and uh, whether you're in the United States, wherever you are in the world, need to be advocating for the human rights of all people everywhere. But let's focus in where human rights have been so crushed for 70 years in, in, the, in that space between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean. Um, Nora's book lays out exactly what kind of human rights and and one of the things I don't want to have lost in 
a sense of disagreement between us because we're we're aiming for the same future with with somewhat different techniques but i think the advocacy for a palestinian state has done important work for raising up the identity mm -hmm. the claim to human rights especially the human rights of self determination I think participating in the boycott, which will be an act of courage for anyone. Um, but this all, these are things all of us can do to constantly recognize the humanity of people everywhere, especially those who are in the most oppressed conditions. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there. That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, Again, so much. I, let me let me just. I guess I like that. Um, usually, we end on this idea of what you can do, but I want to build on what you just said, which is to say, absolutely. I mean, one of the reasons I'm so committed to transnational solidarity is not because it's a fad, but because there is no other way, right? There is no other way. There is no way that Palestinians are somehow going to free themselves from the intricacies of what basically is mili unequivocal military economic you know, support, diplomatic support from the United States to Israel, that they're somehow going to free themselves from those strictures as the, as, you know, oppressed peoples in the United States uh, remain in their condition, right? This won't happen in this vacuum. And that's something very similar that's happened and crystallized in Black Palestinian solidarity, which is, you know, a realization that there is a feedback loop between US's endless wars in the Middle East and the militarization of law enforcement in the United States through very specific programs like the 1033 program, which is the distribution of excess military weapons to local police precincts, which is very explicit in the training of US police officers by, by Israel, the Israeli army, right? That th these ideas that bring to the fore the same critique that James Baldwin made, which is to affirm that Harlem is occupied territory, occupied territories, occupied territory. And to think about, right, what is the relationship between the foreign and the domestic that becomes inextricable? Nora, the, the, the whole problem of excessive use of force has migrated back into the United States from the militarism that we projected abroad. And it was really from realist political thinking that military power always prevails over law that got the United States into Vietnam, that, and that's the critical moment when we shift in favor of Israel against the Soviet Union and continue that militarized form of relation and orientation toward other peoples and other spaces in the world. And that's why I'm calling for a really radical new way of prioritizing uh, respect for life, humanity, integrity of the body so that we will begin to unreverse this and look for alternatives to the kind of violence which this very narrow and problematic mindset of realist political theory has, has uh, so captured us. That's where I think ultimate liberation is to be found in freeing us from that idea that militarism, violent power, weapons are the true power. Nothing could be further from the truth. Ideas. And I, I, I see which I, and I completely see what you mean. I think that, you know, my disagreement with you is not necessarily on that, because I do think that we have to free ourselves from that stricture is but about, you know, um, the, the question of, of like the, the morality of it earlier, but just to build on what you said, yes. And it's precisely why, and this connects to one of the questions that the student, this cluster of questions around, you know, the charge of anti-Semitism. For the most part, Palestinians have used nonviolent means for resistance, right? From boycott, right? To the, the boycott, divestment, and sanctions is at its core a nonviolent project, right? Even if- And know, the use of courts. The use of courts, going to the ICC, going to the ICC. The ICJ. Using, trying to use universal jurisdiction. My work, trying to use the alien tort statute, the work of, you know, cultural cultural events fundraisers right resisting you know music film all of these things are and these are the things that work nora and these but these are the things that palestinians have been doing one do not get attention ever ever instead they all, they they are rarely reported when palestinians even taking up think about the gaza great march of return 
it was think the, about the international court of justice case right but the the gaza march of return you have some 30 30 to 40. no i'm i'm suggesting to you it is working we are having this conversation because it's working i well i would disagree with you because even in you, that you know what's not going to work military force violent that, force that is what has not worked so i don't it's think it's important to hear about the great march of return because it's not actually hurt there was no there was no force in the Gaza March of Return. It was 30 to 40,000 Palestinians who were marching, literally, who were having picnics with family, who were at the border to assert from land day to Nekba day. That was the idea that they would have the right to return. They were shot I like know. birds. Yeah. And, and the way oh. that it was framed, this is not a critique. This is not an advocacy for, for use of force. This is to say, I'm answering the question about, you know, that Palestine, Palestinians, the majority of their work has been this kind of resistance. The problem is it doesn't get attention, right? The third problem is, is that even when they are doing this in nonviolence, it is weaponized as being anti-Semitic. The Great yes. March of Return was seen as anti-Semitic. The BDS movement is seen as anti-Semitic. The use of law is considered lawfare. Use of laws, lawfare, and considered anti-Semitic. So here we have, you know, these this incongruence where Palestinians cannot do anything almost except for surrender or otherwise be charged with either being bigots or being terrorists. And that put this is this is the foreclosure of opportunities of resistance. It's not, you know, and I think that that's precisely why I advocate. So for the students who are asking, well. How do you resist this? This is gonna, you know how we resist this? The same way that folks have resisted other forms of illegitimate law, which is to break it, right? Which is to, in my opinion, is to break it in mass, to demonstrate and to highlight its illegality. I'm already named in a Title VI suit using this framework for merely giving a book talk. So we are in a, that's- Let me just suggest one other, Go ahead. Everything you say is going to have great resonance with so many audiences. I'm just going to suggest that the way that does not work and, and the way I have studied so closely for 30 years, military force, it is a fool's game. War is stupid. People who believe in the ideas of realism don't haven't looked at the endless wars and the complete failures in Afghanistan. And if you think, you know, if you think that the constant violence that Israel has brought to the Palestinian people means that that's a successful society, I, I don't see it. Success is flourishing in peace. And that is not how we can describe Israel. Let's think about what you said before is, is exactly the more important starting place. You said that this is not going to work strategically to take up violence for Palestinians. It has not. The, the, it, it takes the complete breakthrough and new ideas to get rid of that highly problematic fiction that violence is the way to create flourishing societies. This is a mischaracterization of history. It is a wrong diagnosis of military strategy. As I said, if you look, the only time when military force works is when one army is pushing another army out of a clearly defined and understood international boundary, period. There, the way though that you have captured in your book is to open people's minds to something beyond that failed violence. And, and that, all I'm urging is for whatever reason, stick with your idea that strategically violence is not going to work. I'll add the, cause I can't help myself, the moral and the legal reasons why it doesn't work either. Whichever avenue it's taking us to this place of ideas where expansion and possibility lie and true visions of success, not to mention it, it, it brings dignity to the, to the people who engage in it. You know, I just, I was looking at the Times of Israel and once again, the Israeli government is coming out with another program to help with the PTSD of its veterans. Why do Israeli veterans have PTSD? Because their government has called on them to do the most immoral things. Helping people understand that 
that this is not successful for Israel either is the way forward. I think you and I have these, we've been given the opportunity to talk about these problems in terms of law. And you have given people the insight into how law has been misused and the failure to connect it with a truly successful political movement in Palestine has undermined its possibilities. That's where real constructive work can, can go. A lot of responsibility lies with um, with Israelis. <laughs> and, <laughs> no, responsibility, I tell you, it's responsibility lies with everyone. As one of the students pointed out, and, and another thing Nora does so well in the book, and I almost made all my comments about the US's role. Yeah, 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 yeah. Please, who's supplying the weapons? Mm -hmm. So the, the, the US, we need to work on the ideas in this country. We are the, the country that celebrates military force and our right to self-defense and our liberation moment from the British through war, our advance of human rights for enslaved people through violence. Where has it gotten us? To George Floyd, this is, this is a moment, this is a post-pandemic, this is a moment of racial reckoning. This is a moment that those of us who have had the benefit of living and learning in relative peace have to pay back. And it's it's got and and Nora, I'm just celebrating your gift to break through and help people see the underlying structure of the ideas of what is law. I don't want you to change anything except <laughs> a little more caution on more levels, not just strategic, but, but moral and, and, and legal on, on use of violence. Yeah, before I uh, um, give you Nura the, the last word, but Absolutely. I just want to speak on, on that point about, um, you know, um, Marielle and your point about Nura's book and argument and work and activism and scholarship. Um, helping people see, and yes. one of the problems that she that, that that those kind of arguments run against is, you know, the Orientalism that is so entrenched that really actually prevent uh, people from seeing that it's not okay to put, you know, fences and walls and put children in cages. Uh, and so, so kind of an absurd <sighs> moment was when so many people kind of mobilized against putting uh, children in cages. Um, uh, in the U.S.-Mexico border, but they did not make the connection to other children in cages, uh, which are Palestinian children prisoners is the major prison, I mean, the issue of prisoners in, in general, but uh, children in particular. So, uh, so that, that the thing is that it's not just self-evident, oh, you just need to see, because there are uh, lenses that prohibit people from seeing. Anyway, sorry, Nora. Last word, and then I think, we'll no, I, tell you, I think that that's really a good point because I think that it's that same kind of framework and approach that can, you know, have Palestinians literally be leaders, right, and nonviolent resistors in teaching the world life, like as Rafif Ziada has shared with us in her poetry and her scholarship, teaching people life of ways to resist, right, that should otherwise be celebrated, where we can literally have thousands of Gandhis day in and day out. And yet the response to us is you need to be less violent. But why is it that in all of the work that we've done in all of this giving and in this production that there is an inability to see that it is precisely what Palestinians have done. That is what they're doing. That is their primary mode of resistance. It's actually what they've taught other people how to do. And it's, it's circulated in that way and it's quite inspiring. And it's not because of the lack of that work or they, Palestinians don't need to be taught nonviolence. Palestinians need to be seen. That work needs to be lifted, right? Our Gandhis have, have exist and abound and exceed. And so I think that part, of, yeah. And so what does that have to do with, you know, if you're a law student, they said, what can law students do? Well, one of the things that you can do at the law school is really, you know, Harvard law students wrote a note, published it in the Harvard Law Review that basically takes down the most canonical legal arguments that frames um, Palestinian advocacy in the United States and primarily BDS as anti-Semitic. So I would say that use your positionality in the best way possible 
you know, in order to, to leverage the things that Palestinians are already doing to make it more visible. Right now, there's a, a, a pitched fight with Facebook, which oversees Facebook and Instagram over using anti-Zionism as an index for anti-Semitism, which will preclude yet another forum where Palestinians have been able to showcase their work, right? Their resistance through taking care of the water and the land and one another that might be precluded so that they don't have that space either. So that if you, maybe that's a place where you resist. And in terms of the US, the thing that I tell even Palestinian American audiences, and I will tell you as, a, as um, US audiences, is that in order to be the best advocates for Palestinian rights and to oppose you know, these endless wars is to be committed right now um, to the movement for black lives and to be committed for indigenous emancipation and pushing back on settler decolonization. It's incredibly, incredibly, you know, violent that the Biden administration has says that oil will run through the Dakota Access Pipeline, for example, right? You wanna be an ally to Palestine, we have to recognize that this is about a, a settler colonial taking or that the Biden administration said that we need to investigate whether or not that the officer who shot uh, Duarte Wright with, who thought she was using a taser but shot him with a gun. We need to investigate that further, but we can unequivocally say that any harm to, you know, a destruction of property is unequivocally bad. There is something, there's a discrepancy here. There's a, so in my, you know, my final word is to be able to support Palestinians abroad is going to require in the United States also somewhat of um, a spiritual shift, right? So the same thing that I'm advocating in the book, I'm advocating here. This is not a mental practice. This is not a legal argument. This is a spirit, this is spiritual work, right? To be able to see ourselves in different ways, to redefine our threats to ourselves, to redefine safety, to redefine who are our children, right? And I think that being able to see Palestine in that way means being able to see ourselves in that way, which is, so begin at home in order to be able to do that work abroad. So I'll, yeah. that'll be my last word. I love concluding with this spiritual shift and the ability to see and to see the interconnections and the transnational connections. Uh, and I'm thinking um, of um, when Du Bois traveled to the ghetto Warsaw uh, after the World War II, and he was able to understand and see the relationship, not the the equation, but the relationship between his experience in the American South um, and what happened there. Uh, so I think that this is a very um, um, good, profound note uh, to end with the spiritual shift, this understanding uh, and the, the point about seeing and not seeing and what goes into the not seeing and what goes into the seeing, uh, suffering and humanity uh, of everybody. Um, and uh, with uh, awareness of how to address historical injustice as well, uh, not through kind of blindness that now we are all equal or, or whatnot, what kind of uh, frame that we, um, um, uh, is available to, you know, to kind of retrieve. So um, thank you so much. It's such an honor to, to kind of moderate and be a part of this um, superstar um, panel. I know that it really kind of, um, uh, there was a lot of interest and love poured in the Q and A, um, and people were disappointed that the chat was closed. I had no idea that the chat was closed. Uh, so um, thank you so much, and um, uh, and more to talk about. <laughs> to be continued. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Bye bye. And bye.